You know, a while back I was checking Instagram and there's an account that I follow called Zeit Vibes. And this is a guy who actually posts album artwork and pictures of his record collection along with sample audio. And from what I can tell, has every album ever that featured vibraphone. He's, he's even got some albums that I'm on in it. So, you know, there's that. One of the things that he posted recently was an album or a track from a vibraphonist I had never heard of. And I've been searching for obscure vibraphonists and I had never heard of this guy. And I listened to a minute of it and I was immediately knocked out by how great it was. And then I started thinking, why have I never heard of this guy? Well, the guy's name was Freddie McCoy. He was born in 1932 and he lived until about 2009. But for a brief period in the mid to late 60s and into the early 70s, he was a musician. And then he very quickly left the music industry and never recorded again after 1971. And his recordings are really great. I highly recommend you check them out. In fact, that's what I'm going to do in this video. I have a track pulled up. I've never listened to it before. It's a Freddie McCoy record from 1968. It's one of his last recordings under his own name, of which he recorded seven. And this is a recording of the Cole Porter standard, Love for Sale. We're going to listen to it, react. I've got the vibes ready. I've got the piano ready. So any musical things that I hear and anything that kind of catches my ear, I'm going to try to dissect it for you and explain what's happening, if I can. This is going to be a reaction. I have not listened to this, so I have no idea what it's like. Here it is, Freddie McCoy's version of Love for Sale. Let's check it out. I like that Rhodes. They're in the key of C. <laughs> C-ish. is so strong in the background when they have a repeating ostinato pattern like that. It makes it so easy for the singer, or in this case the vibraphonist, to just play freely on top of it. Here comes the bridge. Organ. Oops, sounds like a C alter uh, C seven sharp nine. I like the drummer, Al Dreers is his name. Wally Richardson on guitar. I mean, it's straight up rock, kind of. Uh huh. That break. You sometimes hear people use that major sixth with the minor third, you get that tritone. It's a really nice bluesy sound and yeah. I also like that Freddie McCoy waited until that final cadence to go that high up on the instrument and really bring some power to it. I'm gonna back it up and check that again. Form. Mm -hmm. Paraphrasing the melody. <laughs> the recording's a little out of tune. Huh. <laughs> 
<laughs> I like that. He's really sticking on sort of around the melody and improvising around it, but this is something that is a lost art form to a lot of young musicians who think, okay, it's solo time, now it's time to like whip off all the arpeggios and scales and all the fancy stuff that I know. And man, a lot of times the winning formula is to play the melody and just embellish it a little bit, and uh, clearly that's what Freddie McCoy is a master at. Let's listen to some more. Space. So, uh, two, three, four. Just the amount of space in there that he's using, it's, it's so clear that he's sung the song before, or he's heard it sung before, and he knows the lyrics, and he knows how to space out his phrases to increase the tension, right? When he plays something like this, you're waiting for the resolution of that phrase, and that's a form of increasing tension in the listener. It keeps you waiting, because you're wondering how he's gonna finish that phrase, and then he gives you this. It's just a great punctuation. It's a lesson in how to use space and simplicity in your solos. Beautiful. So relaxed. Oh, that's so beautiful. Paraphrasing the melody. A little blues right there. Something like this. Simplicity. Oh, what a beautiful thing. Now we got saxophone. Gene Walker. On, well, I don't know if that's Gene Walker. It says Gene Walker only played on uh, tracks one and five. This is track three on the record, so I don't know who the saxophone player is here. Uh, did you hear what he did there? He used a dead stroke. He's mount some mallet dampening. He's, he didn't just play, he played. So he went. That's something that you'll see Bobby Hutcherson and hear Bobby Hutcherson do a lot. It's where you hit the instrument and then dampen it with the same stick. Just again, the, the, the motto here is all the different ways you can get variety from just the melody, basically. And it's it's masterful. I backed it up a little bit. There it is. Listen to that articulation. It's not just, you know, the... real nuance to the way he's playing the melody. Something you hear Johnny Lytle do a lot, this sort of dead strokes. I'm just gonna vamp it out. Oh yeah. Did it bamp did it? That was really cool the way he damped and dampened those notes. I don't know, maybe he used two mallets or just did it like that. And he's also hitting those that major sixth and minor third a lot. Just great stuff. Right, you got some chops. 
time field is also fantastic. Oh yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. This type of playing where somebody is just trying to play the melody and make it feel good. I mean, to make a melody feel good is very difficult. It's something that people kind of don't think about, I think. I know that I myself didn't really think about it a lot. This is why learning jazz standards is important. This is why listening to singers is important. This is why really thinking about how you're going to play the melody to whatever tune it is, whether it's the most modern original composition you've ever come up with, or whether it's Love for Sale by Cole Porter, which by the way, is not one of the easy jazz standards. I also just got to say, I love when you have a Fender Rhodes and it's just playing a groove. You have the tritone, the seventh and the third, and you just move them up and down in half steps. It's just always, that's always a winning groove to me. And the arrangement on this is great too. The Rhodes and then the organ in the background on the bridge, it all serves to give this underbelly, which is just rocking and constantly moving forward and constantly propelling the energy of the tune, which gives Freddie McCoy the freedom to do all that little nuanced stuff on top of it. If the rhythm section in the background is swimming around too much or is not really defined, then we wouldn't notice all of that stuff that Freddie McCoy was doing, like with the dead strokes and the little flams and just the, the, the different nuance that he was getting out of the instrument. We wouldn't notice it because the rhythm section would be too distracting. But in this case, it's such a, it's a, it's a train engine that is on a track and we know where it's going and that just allows uh, Freddie McCoy to, to be the conductor hat and he's just like waving at the passers-by as the train is going and having a little fun, little smile on his face, whatever, what have you. That's the image that I get when I think of this analogy. So maybe that's a little too much, I don't know, whatever. Let me know what you thought of Freddie McCoy in the comments. Have you heard of him before? Had you checked out any other records? And are there any other people like this that I don't know that I should know and that we can learn about together? So please let me know about that stuff in the comments and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.